welcome back to CFS Summit 2022, Render the Digital Reality. My name is Enrique Menendez, Editor-in-Chief at CFS and your host for this year's summit. Today's day one culture, the art of digital. And we're so excited to have all of you with us in virtual reality at the Grand Palais Ephemer in the Spin Metaverse. Our topic for today's panel is the right way to create a digital NFT. Our moderator is Jurgen Ackler, head of NFT studio at Heist Nobiety. And for our speakers, we have Nico Roche, head of art partnerships at Dapper Labs, Sebastian Fahey, executive lead of Metaverse at Sotheby's, Alexia Planas Lee, head of impact design and innovation at Spin, and Constantino Sponayoto, founder at Pet Liger. This is a really wonderful conversation to launch our day on culture. And as this is this year's theme, render the digital reality, understanding the meaning, the applications, and the potential of digital is integral to our exploration over these next four days. The digital world where a product or environment exists both physically and digital is on the rise. And to sort of understand what that means, we only need to look around at the space that we're in, which is a one-to-one -one interactive digital NFT of the Grand Palais Ephemer. Fashion, our design is constantly evolving and it's hungry for new ways to innovate and connect. And today we're going to hear from some of the top creators and leaders in the NFT space on what this present and maybe the future of digital realities holds. And I'm now pleased to hand it over to Jurgen, who will guide our conversation today. Great to be here. And it's amazing to get this group of people together and looking at digital from all different angles. And we hope we can provide some value to all of you and share some knowledge that we have in that space and share our viewpoints on it. And I would like to start with a short introduction. So everyone, please just introduce yourself uh, for around a minute. And then at the end, maybe just add something, how you understand digital, what it means to you um, and how you look at it. So let's start with whom do we start with? Nicole. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the director of partnerships at Dapper Labs. So I work across Dapper platform to bring startups, developers, enterprise brands, IP and creators into Web3 and onto Flow. Um, I'm essentially a crypto cupid. So I help these partners connect the dots uh, as they make their journey into the ecosystem. And that could be through helping to develop go-to-market strategies, connecting with developer partners, uh, token grants, et cetera. Um, for me, digital refers to a digitized physical asset or a physical asset with a digital counterpart. Thank you very much. Konstantinos, you're next on my camera here. Hi, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Panayotu. I'm the founder and artist at Pet Liger. Uh, I've been an artist my entire life, uh, specializing in different mediums from fine art to music production, photography, um, and now 3D digital art. Um, so yeah, over the past four years or so, I've been creating a digital footwear concept uh, every day and uh, posting it to the Pet Liger Instagram page. Um, so that's roughly 1,500 uh, unique artworks in total uh, over the last four years. Um, it started off simply as a way to sort of express myself and as a passion project. Uh, but before I, knew, before I knew it, um, major brands and public figures started knocking on my door. Um, and yeah, and about a year ago, I was approached by Metaverse Builders Wild the World uh, to design some uh, digital collectibles uh, collections for them. Um, that ended up being a huge success. They completely sold, sold out. And that was where my Metaverse journey began. Um, so for the past year, I've been transitioning from artist into brand um, with the help of my good friend, uh, Calibrate, uh, who he, he was the first one to tell me about NFTs and, you know, and blew my mind with it. So uh, since then, we've been releasing uh, several independent collections on both Rareable, uh, Super Rare, uh, plus my artworks were featured uh, on the Gucci Vault art space as well. 
which was a huge honor. Um, yeah, it's been a roller coaster, <laughs> to say the least. So, uh, yeah, uh, how would I explain uh, Fidgetal? Um, yeah, essentially, I would, I would say it's a product that can be authenticated um, on chain. Um, it can be a physical item that happens to be accompanied by its uh, unique smart contract, uh, mainly for authentication, I would say. So, um, and there's there's varying levels of complexity depending on the on the contract as well. Thank you very much. Very impressive, Sebastian. You're the next. Thanks, Jürgen. Uh, Sebastian Fay, I'm uh, the managing director of Sotheby's in Europe and the Middle East, and. Uh, executive lead for Sotheby's NFT and Metaverse business. I've been with Sotheby's since 2004, and we've been selling NFTs since uh, April of last year. So um, we uh, launched our own Web3 uh, platform in October of 21, uh, Sotheby's Metaverse, which is housing many of our NFT sales. Uh, when I look at um, Fidgetals, um, I think another Another way of thinking of, of Fidgetals is to think of um, connected products or networked products. Uh, so something with a, a physical work with a digital twin or digital component. Um, and we've had a number of sales using, um, using Fidgetals going from, from artworks that have um, very much a physical component with a digital element, so a screen embedded in a, in a canvas through to um, a um an, a physical artwork or a physical item that has a digital twin which uh, contains information like the provenance for an artwork and comes and we see the two packets together hi thanks so much for having me it's really nice to meet you all i'm alexia i'm the head of impact design and innovation at spin and at spin uh, what we're doing is a web3 mixed reality marketplace for fashion art and architecture so for us, a digital NFT is a physical asset that is connected to its digital, uh, 3D digital twin via IoT labels, where its product information and transactions are all traced on blockchain. So we help creators do this with Spin by allowing them to easily digitize and connect the physical items by first providing them our IoT label printer that you use to attach the individual QR labels at item level. And then these are these garments are traced throughout the value chain in this way. So when these digital NFTs are, are transacted, they're also enabling circular business models such as selling, take back, rental, swap, borrow. And we're also very excited to be announcing here for the first time actually that we will be launching auctions very early next year. And until now, we've been applying this uh, solution across fashion, such as uh, with the Vogue Philippines digitized traditional garments uh, project that they did also applied to art, uh, such as with a Murakami painting that we worked with Fondazione Sozzani Foundation to, to create the digital twin. And also with architecture, such as with the Grand Palais and the Grand Palais Femer, which in this case, these are not following the sale model, but the rental business model. So these vegetal NFTs, uh, we've actually been renting them to host the annual CFS Summit inside Spin VR since uh, 2021. That's a great range of what we have here together. So very new, so to say, companies and something, a company like Sotheby's founded in 1744. So I looked that up and I was impressed, you know, how old Sotheby's is. And that's why it made quite some waves when you entered that NFT space pretty early, so to say, <clears throat> already in the first half of last year. How did that happen? How did it come that Sotheby's became interested in it? And were you already into digital art before NFTs? So digital art is, is not new. Digital art's been around since uh, the 1950s and following sort of conceptual art, going through video art, um, many different waves of, of digital art, but it's not really been a mainstay of the of the auction art world, the traditional art world. And um, NFTs as a, as a technology, the ability to ascribe um, title and to understand ownership um, really allows digital artists to bring their works to market. So we've been following um, obviously, we've been following digital art for, for many, many years, but this has really been um, housed by institutions rather than uh, collections, I would say. 
Um, and seeing the use of the technology, the growing co community and uh, collector base around digital art, um, and then the more widespread adoption of, of, of NFTs, um, we'd been following for, for some time until we decided to take the first sale that we had of digital art with the uh, legendary creator pack back in April um, of last year. Um, so that was our first entry into, um, into selling NFTs and very quickly realizing that we, um, we wanted to um, build a, a category around NFTs, around digital art to go alongside the, the art and digital, uh, the art and uh, um, collectibles, physical um, works that we sell. Yeah, that's great. And we're going to pick up that discussion uh, at that point in a few minutes again, because it's super interesting how you enter the space and how you move forward and also digging a little deeper into digital uh, with the Sotheby's look. On the other hand, um, Nicole, I'm I'm excited about Dapper Labs and uh, you have to tell us a little bit how Dapper Labs started because the first time I remember it was looking at CryptoKitties. And that was the first NFT project I ever realized. I think it was 2018. And I thought, how dumb is that? Why should anyone buy cats as a JPEG and own it? And then I can combine different cats to new cats and raise them. And then fast forward, you're launching NBA Top Shots where millions of kids are buying NBA moments and now you're extending this overall thing. That's quite a crazy journey. Uh, can you get us a little bit along the journey and, and how that was and, and how, how that company grew? Yeah, for sure. I can give you a little peek behind the curtain. Uh, so as you mentioned, CryptoKitties uh, was the first digital asset to be minted on the blockchain. Um, we launched CryptoKitties on Ethereum. We broke, broke the Ethereum network a few times, which then uh, much to, I think, the uh, behest of our developer team, we created our own code and blockchain with NFTs at the heart. Um, we understood the challenges of the Ethereum network and their ability to scale. Um, and scale quickly. Uh, and so we created uh, the Flow blockchain, which is our own layer one blockchain. Uh, and with that, we uh, have been able to build uh, consumer facing dApps, uh, NBA Top Shot, uh, NFL All Day, UFC Strike, um, lots of sports IP. Uh, but also we work with, uh, I think we have 8,000 developers building on Flow currently. We have marketplaces like Rarible that are integrated um, we have Blockdo Bay, we have, um, you know, CNN, the likes of Tibbles, Dr. Seuss, um, lots of IP that is, has come into our ecosystem. Um, and we're really focused on building out, you know, a sustainable blockchain uh, infrastructure, right? So not talking about a flash in the pan or a one-off project. We're looking at, you know, building out Web3 strategies, whether it's for enterprise brands or bringing in, you know, Web2, Web2.5 uh, dApps and startups into the ecosystem to really leverage blockchain uh, and, and flow in particular. And Constantinos, when was for you the moment when you understood what NFTs are and what the potential is? And were NFTs even important to you? Because it would be fair to say you could have done your digital creations already without NFTs and you could have just posted them on Instagram and nobody would realize it has anything to do with you know, crypto, NFTs, et cetera? Oh, wow. Um, that's a good question. So, yeah, for for the last four years, um, I've been doing these artworks and not really knowing where where, where it would go. Um, I thought maybe like a large brand might, might come to me and I end up selling my designs to them in that way. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it came as a bit of a surprise. Like I, I heard about NFTs. And I kind of understood what they were, uh, but I don't think you fully understand something until you do it. And um, and when Wild the World approached me to do these collections for them, that was the eureka moment for me because I, I actually experienced going through the whole thing. Um, so I did about three hundred uh, unique designs for them, um, and the speed is something actually that's something people don't really talk about is is how quick you can actually get things done. In, in the digital space. Um, so a hundred unique designs for, for collection number one, and that was done in like 10 days and then straight to auction. And I just, I will never forget that day. Um, just seeing the auction in front of me in real time 
and just my mind being blown like what is going on um and yeah um and that was it like I kind of knew this is the direction I, I have to head in um and really take ownership of my IP and not rely on a bigger brand or a company to kind of save me as an artist um you know um so yeah that's what we've been focused on for the past year just trying to understand the space uh transitioning from artist into brand and what does that mean in terms of the metaverse um and it's it's there's a lot of pathways a lot of different avenues we, you know we we are looking at you know the digital side and the physical side as well of things i think they go hand in hand 100% yeah and that's and, and that's a perfect bridge because every one of you talked very much about digital things and you could now wonder why should we care even about physical stuff you know it's great we can do the most amazing creations in digital there are no barriers non no physics apply ever so why are so many people in that nft space have the desire to create something physical and this is this bridge that is called digital so why is that interesting to you because you could say you know, I keep creating the most crazy designs and shoes in, in virtual. So why do you mm -hmm. even bother about physical? I think um, right now there, there needs to be a, some familiarity anyway. Um, we can do some crazy stuff with digital. Um, but, but I don't think um, in terms of the market, I think it's good to have some familiarity. So things have to be grounded in reality. Uh, not too crazy um and i think that's something my designs do really well a lot of people don't know that my designs are are actually digital i get messages all the time people saying where where can i get the physical uh please you know uh we actually need to make a, a wish list actually for for that um so yeah um yeah and it's actually um what, what really interests me is the idea that someone can have like an infinity closet with thousands of outfits, digital outfits, um, but they can have maybe five to 10 real world outfits that are really high quality, um, ethically produced, um, and they can just dip into their digital outfits whenever they want, you know? Uh, so um, it's exciting in, in terms of, again, questions about sustainability and all, the, all this stuff, it, it's, it's all very relevant. Um, the, the digital side i think so yeah, Let, yeah. let's dig dig that deeper uh in a few minutes because i think mm. you're, you're saying something really interesting that on the one hand you can express yourself digitally in in million ways so why not having you know virtual clothing on every single i don't know minute you could look different if you want to and then just focus on a few really interesting pieces and maybe you know fast fashion uh, mm. will disappear more people will focus more on on certain things but what does that mean for Sotheby's because Sotheby's could say okay we sell this art like we always sold this is physical and now we have our NFT marketplace that is digital so why is Sotheby's interested in digital and does that mean in the future each physical artwork comes with an NFC chip and that represents an NFT at the same time or how are you looking at that or what are your thoughts or plans or just curious yeah uh, interesting question uh when I, when we first entered the market we, i was asked very regularly um about how we see um nfts disrupting the art world uh, i see it very differently i see it as very complementary um as i was mentioning before the um the lack of ability for a digital artists to ascribe ownership and and uh, and from that value um, to to their works um, is the reason why digital art wasn't part of the mainstay of the art world um, previously. Um, but entering the NFT market has um, you know our, our focus initially and and in Web three uh, was on digital art. But as we've gone further down this journey, seeing the ability for Web three to shape how we sell both physical <laughs> and digital art in the future um, is um, is something that is spending we're spending a lot of time and a lot of thought on now. And I don't think it's too far in the future to be thinking that each physical work would come with some form of digital um, 
digital twin, digital record of, of the sale. Um, there are many ways uh, that Web3 technology can solve for some of the long-standing issues within the art world, like the recording of, of provenance information or authenticity. You know, if, um, if artists today were releasing an NFT with every, um, uh, every work that they produced and somehow tethering those and keeping those together, that would be a very good way of demonstrating the authenticity of, of that work for future um, collectors. Um, so yes, this is very much a area, of, a topic of, um, of a lot of explanation, uh, exploration um, right now of how physical items may um, benefit from having a, a digital identity. Um, just rather than thinking of this about digital art taking over from physical art. Um, the two will live side by side, but there is an element of the digital having a importance and a, and, uh, and a value when being sold with um, or connected with uh, physical items. Yeah, and I always was wondering, how does it actually work? You know, I have the Mona Lisa and I put an NFC tag next to it. I can still take the NFC tag off and glue it to something else because I can't weave it into, you know, the Mona Lisa and make sure it's a proof of authenticity that this is the only Mona Lisa that is out there. So I think there need to be smarter ways in bridging the gap between a physical artwork and the digital one. And I just had a moment, you know, last week when I ordered the Tom Zex print and I found that quite interesting. You know, I ordered that print because I want to have it at my home. I love mm -hmm. being at home. I like that it's nice, but I don't have hundreds of people running through my home. At the same time, I can claim an NFT now. There's a QR code on it, which I found pretty cool. So I have it in my wallet and I can display that to everyone out there. And everyone, you know, who looks into my wallet or walks through my own cyberspace can see, oh, he's owning this thing. So I like that combination of it is part of my digital identity. So people understand, oh, he's a Tom Sachs collector. Oh, he owns X, Y, Z, other things. But at the same time, I'm still a physical human being and I love looking at it at my home. I was, Why is oh sorry? Uh, just on on this, the, the the way that we can tether um, a digital um, a digital record with a physical item. There's lots of technology being used at the moment to 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 try to track that and to 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 make that work. Um, just two days ago, I was with a, a team in New York um, from the uh, the company Mirror, which is micro microscopic um, image recognition uh, algorithm, which used deep um, deep algorithmic learning and a microscopic lens to take a scan of a painting and then issue an NFT on the Ethereum um, blockchain. And then when that same painting or same item is rescanned, you can tell with a very high 99.99% degree of accuracy that that is the same um, work of art or, or object. And we did a test uh, with uh, five blank pieces of paper from you know just usual sort of printer paper. Um, and it was able to pick up around 100,000 unique identifiers between a blank piece of paper to say why one was the one that we originally selected out of the five when we scanned. So this is a way of keeping the digital and the physical linked together by rescanning at a later date. Yeah, and I think technologies like these are mind-blowing and then suddenly all make sense and how you can bridge those things. And even if it's physical and has nothing attached to it you just rescan it in 10 years and the technology will probably even be better but you have that unique fingerprint that probably no other artwork will ever have and then of course it makes a lot of sense to bridge that i was surprised honestly you know to see someone from depa labs joining that discussion because i thought damn you have the best business model in the world you don't need to sell any physical items you don't need to have any warehousing or anything um what are the plans of Depa Labs in regards of digital and physical? So I was just curious about that. So I just would be super curious about hearing your standpoint on that. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a fair question. Uh, Sebastian, I think you mentioned it um, at the very beginning, and I think it's a really interesting take as well on digital. Is how are we integrating uh, an NFT into a physical space as well? So I do kind of read digital going both ways and 
um, as you might be familiar with, we also have a partnership with Infinite Objects where you can bring the NFTs into your you know, home environment. They don't necessarily just have to live in your wallet. Um, and to go back to, you know, the reperformance of artwork and collectibles in the house in ways, you know, right behind you, you have a, a blank screen, right, where we could be displaying NFTs. I think there's a lot of underutilized capital in our homes to bring the digital asset into the, the physical realm. Um, from And then expanding on that, I actually just, um, or Dapper Labs in partnership with this team called Seas of Happiness, we just released um, our first kind of digital art project. Um, this kind of went into stealth mode. We launched at an LA pop-up uh, yesterday. So we have 8,888 physical uh, pieces of artwork uh, that have then been you know, meticulously documented and photographed. Uh, so each physical asset has a digital twin. Um, they're you know, distinguishing rarity traits on each uh, asset um, and essentially giving you access to a membership community. It, unlike uh, currency, everyone that has the NFT uh, can receive their physical assets. There's not that piece of tension uh, built in, uh, but we're definitely, you know, expanding, um, you know, the digital world. We're working with Lablico as well, which is super exciting. Um, I think, you know, really being pioneers in this space of uh, digitizing physical spaces, right? So the Grand Pere Ephemer um, being a digital twin of a physical object that we get to experience. Um, and with anything like the 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 use case for digital, it just needs to drive value. So I think as we're we're proofing out these use cases for digital assets, whether it's through um, you know sustainable fashion, um, you know having more transparency in terms of the supply chain, or being in these kind of physical environments that can be repurposed, uh, you know, time and time again for you know to host these kind of um, environments, I think we're going to see more and more use cases uh, come out and, and especially um, on flow. <laughs> Some advertising for flow. <laughs> Great blockchain, definitely. Um, what, what would you say? Who's buying digital? Yeah, it's not really NFTs. Who's buying digital, so to say, products? Is it more the Web3 community who says, oh, nice, now I get something that I can place in my home and I can touch it? Or is this rather the onboarding new people who get the physical piece first, you know, like this Tom Sachs print? I'm sure a lot of people bought that print because of the print. And then they will realize, oh, it comes with an NFT. What's your experience? That that That's a question to all of you. And probably you have different angles looking at it. So where do you see are people coming from? Uh, let's start here on my, my right side, Sebastian, maybe. Uh, when we look, um, I know the question is, is based on digital. So when we look at our um, NFT business just uh, over the last 18 months, the, the buyers on average have been um, 10 years younger than of our physical objects from our traditional uh, collecting categories. So it's a younger audience. Millennials, Gen Z are um, living their lives more digitally and um, becoming increasingly um, understanding of the value of a digital asset, believing in that value, assigning value and, um, and spending on that, um, that, that value. Um, when we look at um, digitals, so we've had a number of different sales, um, which we would class in this, um, in this digital um, or network product um, uh, category. Um, one was um, from the designer, uh, watch designer, Gerald Genta, where the digital aspect um, was very much a record of the authenticity and it came with an authenticity um, certificate coming from the estate because the designs that he painted when he, when he was living were being sold by, by, by his family, by his estate. So that was really being bought by, uh, I would say mostly watch collectors who really valued the fact that they were getting this uh, this certificate right back to the to the family whilst that's uh, available to be um, uh, taken in the market. We also had a sale um, which was called um, physical digital, um, which were um, how you can see these as um, a modern diptych in in many ways where. Um, digital artists were creating physical works with a screen and a digital item. So um, Thank You X is an example of an artist and one of the, um, the co-curators of that sale. Um, this sale was very much um, a bridging between, so the crypto native buyers 
were very attracted to the sale by the, the NFT involvement, and our traditional buyers were very attracted by the fact that they were getting a canvas, something they could easily hang at home um, if they haven't thought about how they would use screens. And I think from uh, Nicole's comments before, um, how screen use and how people see digital art at home is going to be a real um, shift in the adoption of, uh, of, of digital art and the use of, um, uh, of, of, of digital items, I would say. Um, so that user experience as well of um, wallets and um, a lot of collectors don't have digital wallets today. As they do, then thinking about that digital twin, though, so the, you know, the, the, the digital record of the physical item, the understanding of why that is a benefit and being able to hold that will increase as as people start using um, wallets more and um, have more of a sort of adoption of the technology. And Constantinos, do you think when you have physical products that will bring new target groups to what you're actually doing and they will buy the NFTs to it at a later stage? Or do you think the physical product is good for you that you're digital holders, you know, even get closer to you because maybe they value something they can touch even more than just a JPEG? Um, the, the way I look at the physical side of things is um, more like a, a reward, something you unlock. So maybe you, someone buys maybe five pet Liger silhouettes and that, that combination of those five could unlock a physical. Um, and it would be something that I think it's it's the inverse way of thinking. I think now people are thinking, okay, you 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 get the physical and then you get the digital as an add-on. But I, I like to look at it the other way around. So, and I think it's a good way to incentivize people to buy the digital as well, um, as opposed to focusing just on the physical side of things. Um, yeah. So yeah, like I mean, a, a lot of my designs, I can't tell you what materials they're made of I, you know they're made from some some space age i otherworldly stuff you know that doesn't probably probably doesn't exist um in our reality uh, but we could make one that is you know made of like really you know uh, like carbon fiber and titanium and these really rare sort of materials and it could be a very unique piece like a like a like an artwork within itself. Um, so, being able to unlock that, I think, I think is really exciting to me because um, it's one thing seeing your work on a screen, and then it's another thing actually seeing, seeing, seeing it in front of you and holding it. Um, I mean, I've I've worked in high fashion for for about ten years prior to all this stuff. Uh, just when I was a teenager, you know, working in retail. And no, nothing really beats having the real thing in your hand, I think, and, and being able to feel the, the material, the texture, uh, the smell, everything. Uh, so, um, yeah, it should be more of a reward, I would, I would like to think of it, like uh, unlocking yeah. it. I think absolutely that, that that's a super smart way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, if we zoom out of our NFT bubble a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, I'm having a lot of discussions and we're reading all of that that everyone says retail is dead, people are not going outside anymore, and that big corporations wonder, okay, what do I do with all my real estate? What do I do with these things? And I found it funny that we are discussing a way on how digital things get into physical. Sometimes I think, aren't those companies who know how you know, retail works, for example, in a much better position? Because couldn't it be easier to set up digital than physical so i don't know a company that knows how to run 200 stores i think that's way more complicated than just i don't know you know starting selling a certain amount of of jpegs so maybe they shouldn't be that scary about the future because when i i look at i don't know nft nyc you go to to this doodle space and it's crowded all the time and the cool cat space and other spaces so also the pandemic proof People love meeting their friends. People love going out into stores, into places, but the experience just needs to be a different one. I don't know. Is, is this nonsense what I'm saying? Or what would you, you think, Nicole, in, in that area? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think there's two touch points there. One is, and, and it's also one of those kind of like barriers to entry for the digital space is it doesn't have the advantage of, uh, I guess you could say scalability on the same level, right? Uh, digital, um, and as you had men mentioned, Constantinos, you can, you can produce something rather quickly and having that physical kind of brick and mortar, obviously that creates a little bit more um, of a barrier. But then you go into these spaces, are they kind of well primed? I think innately as humans, um, we want to have visceral experiences and we want to have shared experiences beyond the screen. Um, I think, you know, in the you know height of the pandemic, we had Zoom doom or Zoom gloom. Um, and I think for us to have these shared experiences and especially around Web3 products, it's about community, right? But bringing that community into a physical space, that's why you see all these conferences that are you know, essentially mayhem is everyone's really, really you know, eager and keen to get out and interact and, and have those shared experiences, which you know, creates more brand loyalty. You have you know, better kind of uh, connections with your, your community, you have better opportunities to build. Um, so yeah, I mean, I agree. I think I think it goes both ways. Alexia, tell us a little bit about what are the plans of Lablaco with merging physical and digital. Yes, for us, everything we do is physical first, with the aim of reaching a digitized and connected circular economy. So, when we're developing Spin VR, it's always as an extension of reality to bring an additional layer of value to the physical world. So as opposed to other metaverses such as Roblox or Decentraland, which are perhaps more focused on gaming or are creating fantasy worlds, we aim to always part from the physical world and create a luxury environment um, that does that, that parts from reality. So we see this, uh, for example, in the digitization of the Grand Palais and Grand Palais Femer, where we brought in the community and brought in a multiplayer experience where the avatars can wear digital twins of real garments. They can see and experience artwork and fashion that are twins of the real world as well, and also speak with others in real time. Sebastian, do you have any contact to any, you know, old companies, brands behind the scenes, et cetera, that ask you for advice or say, okay, you've entered that space as a company that was founded a few hundred years ago. Yeah. What would your advice be for us? because I'm seeing a lot of interest in, in big, big corporates entering the space. And right now they're all looking into how to do it. Um, so that's very encouraging to me, but what would your uh, advice be to someone who approaches you with all of your experiences? Sure, going back to the sort of physical experience in the storefront, when, when, when Sotheby's had their first um, flagship natively digital sale, we were, because this was early, early last year, this was June last year, um, the thinking of that educating of, uh, of, uh, of, of potential buyers. So um, we held physical exhibitions of that sale in, in Hong Kong, in New York, in London, simultaneously. Um, and we also opened a digital replica of our London um, headquarters that I'm in right now in Decentraland. So we were, we were able to have a, a, a very sort of um, metaverse-like virtual um, gallery exhibition um, that people, uh, the crypto native um, crowd could, you know, come with their avatars and, and walk through and, and see what we were selling in that sale in, in, a, in a virtual way. Um, in terms of brands, um, I'm in constant contact with, uh, with, with brands at the moment who are looking to, you know, in the same way that brands um, started to think about um, uh, their e-commerce sort of strategies. They're thinking now of their de-commerce strategies. You know, when people were thinking about having um, their first websites, they're thinking now about laying the foundations of Web3. And I think that's been our, our advice is, you know, diving all the way into what the, the, the metaverse as it's, um, it's got a catch-all phase right now is going to be for that company. Um, or what, seeing what others are doing, like when we opened our, our store in, um, in Decentraland, might not be for everyone. So our advice has been to really think about the industry, the company that they're in, and what may work for, for them uh, internally, um, if this is like staff engagement, or externally, if this is, is, is client engagement, what works for their industry, what work, works for them and laying the foundations at this stage that they can build on um, as, um, as the user experience technology grows and, um, and um, how they can 
um, scale this within their organizations. Konstantinos, are you seeing what you are doing as a template for young designers in the fashion space mainly to build their brands? Because in the past, it took years, you know, you made your design graduate, you were doing internships at certain companies, and then it took years till you maybe became the head of design at a certain company and your products were actually being produced. And now it feels like the whole system is reversed. If you're good in 3D, you can just start and you can build your audience and you get people excited about your work. You create a community, you create a st strong attachment to what you're doing. That's highly emotional if I like the artwork of a certain person. And that helps them maybe to fund a first, you know, batch of 3D printed shoes or a first batch of T-shirts that come with an NFC chip. And that is tied to, I don't know, some benefits uh, around the membership. Isn't this turning the whole system upside down? And do the old brands already know what's happening there? Um, yeah, so it's funny that I, I've had a lot of students approach me um, asking for advice about this about this stuff, and um, and I usually just tell them to get started, like right now, like get involved and start start making your own three D assets um, because it's um, it is still very early in this in this space, um, and I do see it over the next ten years becoming more mainstream and being adopted uh gradually um so now is the time now is the time uh for, for young people to to start getting involved and for, for myself every everything i've learned has been self-taught on on youtube like it, it's um it's incredible because i i tried to get into central st martin's when i was uh when i finished uh school right and unfortunately i didn't make it in but my DMs are now full of Central St. Martin students trying to basically, you know, find out how I how I do what I do. So you don't really need the big institutions anymore um, to, to actually um, have a career in, in art or fashion or design. Um, you just have to kind of trust your eye and and know what you like and just go for it and just like... Um, for myself, it's always about speed as well. It's not just about, you know, you can't just aim for perfection. You can't, you can't get perfection. Just, just be quick. And, you know, when I do my daily, my daily renders every day, um, I give myself about an hour or two max to do a design and whether I like it or not, I will post it on Instagram and, and see what happens and just get feedback because it's, it's, it's a collaborative process as well with, with, the, with the viewer. Right. <clears throat> um, so it's um it's definitely yeah i i encourage uh, young people just to just to follow their passion and just and just start straight away um and get into it and and yeah that that's not really a question but i would like mm. to underline that i think mm. that is the real revolution and it's not about the technology and the nft and this thing about it but it's imagine that your career might have been over because you were not picked by that college and they didn't take you and then you may might have had chosen another job that that's how how the world looked like 10 20 30 years ago okay mm -hmm. if i'm not going that way there's no chance to do it but you can just say i don't care i download blender and i just get going today and i'm sitting here 12 hours a day as a 19 year old playing around with blender and then there will be people out there who, who actually like it and i think yeah. that's as true probably you would agree from a Sotheby standpoint, also for artists, because, you know, I don't need to be in those five galleries that make the artists big. If I'm building my audience and I do stuff and I'm so amazed by the story of Drift, you know, that guy who's climbing these high buildings and is just shooting down. How cool is this story that something like this is possible today that someone can build his career on top of that? Because in the, in the whole world, there's enough audience for him. There, there are probably 500 people who love these pictures and he doesn't need more than those 500 or 5,000. And I think this is what, what is mind-blowing to me all the time that this is giving so many opportunities and chances and it's just built on that technology and, and not 
Okay, so that, sorry, that was not a question, but uh, I think that no, I to totally agree with you. And uh, this, this has allowed so many digital artists to to drop the day job that they had to have before and to build themselves as a, a, a as an artist. And many are building themselves. They're building their communities. They're building their their, their audiences um, online um, through through Twitter, through Discord, through. Um, creating their own um, their, their own drops, their own releases, um, and it's also allowed us as an auction house to work directly with with artists um, on their first um, auction releases, uh, which was previously because of the the physical gallery setting required and um, and and other reasons uh, that that is normally an artist has built up their career, then they've been signed by a gallery and then they've come to market, managed by the gallery. But um, having this in the hands of the artist has been, um, and making their decisions of how they want to control um, their, the release of their works and the collecting of their works has, uh, has been a, a real um, eye-opening and exciting uh, change to watch. I would just and, and, oh, sorry, jump in please. there. Um, and that was yes. kind of for, for my story and my journey into Web3, it was really looking at blockchain. My my background is a, a producer for digital artists. Um, so I produce and help them curate work, et cetera. Um, and I've done that for a decade. And leading up to it, I remember running around Art Basel, Miami with like a USB key uh, and how difficult it was to justify to the buyer. You know, a, you know, back, back then you had potentially like a watermark that would help indicate it and you could have a a SKU that would be registered, but outside of that, you know, not having the ability to necessarily authenticate uh, the piece was obviously a, a, a challenge um, for uh, collectors and, and, you know, artists alike and having this parallel, you know, the independent parallel economy for artists to kind of create on their own um, and independently of, you know, day jobs, right, to kind of propel, especially from in the digital realm, right, um, that creative prowess is, is really fascinating. Yeah, one, and it is early. My, it's very early. Yeah, yeah, it is still early. But on the other hand, it's you know great to see how low the barrier is if you do digital events in the right way. So I was fortunate to join the uh, Bright Moments event in Berlin. And I don't know if any one of you have joined one of their uh, um, Bright Moments events in the I'm somewhere. a crypto New Yorker. I'm a crypto Berliner. So <laughs> that's how cool is that? You had Hundreds of people who had nothing to do with NFTs, cryptos. Everyone can look at colorful things on screens and have an opinion. I dislike that. I like that, etc. And then you had that opportunity to live mint. And I, I will never forget basically that USP saying, you know, we're minting stuff in front of our screens. That's a lonely experience. Most of the times you're sitting there maybe with your ledger. I hope everything goes right. And suddenly you have that live meeting experience in a great environment with great music and light, et cetera. And they said, yeah, this is what we aim for, that people don't forget how their NFT is being minted. That experience should be so great. And they were right. I think it's one of my highlight moments this year, standing there when it was revealed and all the other people around it, the lightning, the music. And that that also you know, did a lot to me saying, oh, there, there's, this is super interesting bridging this from digital into the real world and uh, experience that with more people than just myself in front of a screen. So not sure where this is taking us, but- uh, a, 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 very, uh, a very um, interesting project that G Money uh, is, is launching at Art Basel um, coming up this year is uh, for a, a network project, a t-shirt that is going to be released, um, which has um, a, an NFC chip in there that, uh, can, well, the first iteration of this had an NFC chip that can issue POAPs. So as you're wearing the T-shirt, you can, um, as you're meeting other people, so you might be at a conference or you might be at a, a concert. Um, but the the second version, which will be released at um, uh, in in Miami, will also have a live minting experience with uh, with um, Snowfro from Artblocks uh, with a a version with the the, the DNA of the algorithm for. Uh, chromy squiggles uh, which will be then printed on the t-shirt but will be given with a with an nft um of that of that artwork um and i think it just it just sits very nicely with this this digital concept um but also community building through an item of clothing 
Yeah, I, I find that super interesting. You know, I I, I had the chance to uh, talk to G Money uh, before he launched that when we was explaining what he's actually going to do there. And we at High Snow Bite, you know, we have a lot to do with those old fashion brands. And when you talk to people from that industry, they look at what G Money is doing and saying, it's a black t-shirt with a chip, whatever. And he th that should be a luxury brand. So they don't take that even serious on a certain level because for them, it's a black t-shirt. So it's not a luxury brand. And I can understand that thinking because it takes years till your MS or Louis Vuitton and build your brand in that space. It's not just bringing out a black t-shirt with a chip to become a luxury brand. But on the other hand, I found find that quite arrogant also saying, looking at that and saying, okay, what the heck, this is not super interesting. So it's an interesting discussion depending on how from which angle you, you you start looking at it. So luckily, I can see both angles, but and, and I'm, of course I'm more on the innovative side as well. But that's interesting see, seeing those discussions happening where you know old brands say, okay, no, that's nonsense. But maybe that is the luxury brand of the future that's being built un, under our eyes uh, right now. I, I think um, you know we've said a few times it's early, but I think it's such a at a nascent stage of understanding of what um, what is actually being uh, presented here in in that T-shirt, that it's so much more than a T-shirt as a connected product. And from a, a Web3 community, it sold out um, almost in, instantaneously. Um, and I think as people understand what it can deliver, um, you know, what other high fashion T-shirt could you issue, build a community around through ProApps, um, without that technology, as that starts to infiltrate into more. So Dior, for example, are issuing NFCs with, with all of their clothing, which is more on a proof of record and authenticity side. Um, but as the technology grows, I think the use cases and how we see physical items with Web3 technology and what that can deliver, um, I think G-Money was just doing it first. Yeah, I, I read something... I, I read something smart on the internet uh, where it was Web2 is the customer. And I think this is the old way to look at it. I need to sell them again and again. And G-Money probably more looks at it from a perspective that Web3 is about yeah member and not just a customer that I try to sell something again and again. It's just like, okay, I, I built this foundation of people who are around me and, and are more than just customers that I'm selling a product over and over again. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, Konstantinos. No, it's fine. I, we, I've, I've spoken with you, Money, and uh, I'm absolutely um, in love with what he's doing with the, with the NFC chips. I mean, I, I, for me as an artist, what excites me is the, the modularity aspect of it. For example, you could have the T-shirt, and if you have the shoes as well, that there could be something unlocked as well in that, in that regard. Um, so you can have like... Um, multiple parts that combine to create something new um in combination with all the different chips that are that are, that are present so um this is something that we're looking at as well uh, for pet ligo in terms of our footwear designs we want to create a physical that has a chip um inside or actually what what really interests me was the um, what sebastian was saying about how the the artwork itself becomes the chip like that's that's mind blowing uh, because then yeah you get rid of the whole uh, te te techie side and I don't know like um, I'd be worried if maybe it, it, it damaged over time the chip inside or like um, from weathering or things like that I don't know I mean I'm not, I'm not a technical person but but the fact that the item itself becomes the chip is that's that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I also think, you know, everything will be connected mm. either with a, I don't know if it's an NFC chip or if mm. it's the new ways of technology, I think it will be just normal in five years that every piece of apparel will come, come with those things. I, I, I think yeah. that's, I mean, for me, the metaverse thing. is, is everything. It's not, it's not digital. It's not physical. It's, it's the whole thing for me. So yeah, absolutely. Spin recently collaborated with the Sosani Foundation and NABA to create a digital NFT collection of former Vogue Italia editor-in-chief Franca Sosani's personal couture archive. Physical and digital items sold to benefit Franca Sosani's fund for preventive genomics.
Walk us through the functional and practical benefits of this digital collection. Walk us through how the NFT label print and scanner works and how it is backed by blockchain. And of course, what that means for transparency. Yeah, so this was a really special project for us. We applied spin technology to digitize and connect the personal archive pieces of the former editor-in-chief of Vogue Italia. We applied the industry-first uh, IoT label printer that I mentioned earlier, which, by the way, was originally launched with H&M in 2021, where we did the industry-first Web3 rental system. And in this case, what we did is cre we created digital twins for each piece of the Franca Sozzani collection with the help of NABA students. And then we connected these digital twins to the physical twin via the unique QR labels that were sewn to each individual garment. So when the customers came and scanned the QR codes, they were directed to the SPIN webpage and he, there they could discover the uh, product provenance and customer ownership, um, all the tricks trace on blockchain, as well as the environmental impact and then once they buy the digital NFT on SPIN, they receive the digital ownership that includes, on one hand, the 3D digital twin in their SPIN vault, which is our version of a crypto wallet. This enables them to exhibit these twins in SPIN's integrated augmented reality system, as well as SPIN's direct-to-avatar uh, virtual reality system. And all this is instant before receiving the physical item, which is delivered to their doorstep. So through SPIN's Web3 circular retail applications, what we do is allow customers to transact these digital NFTs with fiat currencies, actually. And we're really excited also to announce that in our most recent partnership with Crypto.com, we're also going to bring crypto payments to retail consumers in early of next year. And I would say that one of the most interesting things, if not the most, especially in this case, because all the profit was going to charity, is that the creator actually continues to earn revenue from the secondary market via the royalty fees that are connected to the smart contract. So this is one of the most valuable parts of uh, tracing these transactions on the blockchain and keeping the garments in the loop and connected. And all these transactions, by the way, are being done on the most sustainable or one of the most sustainable blockchains, as Nicole previously mentioned, which is Flow blockchain by Dapper Labs, which for reference, it takes less energy to mint an NFT on Flow than to make just one post on Instagram. And speaking of this project that we did with Fondazione Sozzani, I would love to share also the uh, exciting exhibition that's coming up in January in Galerie Lafayette, Champs-Élysées in Paris. So we're applying the same technology to a project that we've been working on for two years that has been in combination and collaboration with independent brands from all over the world, such as Ouroboros, uh, Lucan Yomdingi, Misohi, and many more, uh, in actually 28 in total. These digital NFTs have been made with all circular materials and processes such as Caring's Material Innovation, lab, um, also 3D printing by EOS. We have circular embroidery by Color Reel. So all these garments will be presented via AR and VR, meaning that also there's no shipments that are taking place to send the garments to the store, which is also reducing carbon footprint. And all the customers will be able to do what we, what we saw also with the Fondazione Sozzani uh, project. So they'll be able to learn about the supply chain, the environmental impact, and then also receive the digital ownership of these digital NFTs. We're really excited about this, uh, this project, and it's going to be launching on the 4th of January, and it's running until the 26th of January, which actually includes also Men's, uh, Men's Fashion Week. So if you're, if you're in Paris, you're super, super welcome to come join us. I think 2022 has been an interesting year. So we've been coming into it with the biggest hype ever and you know stuff was being sold at cra crazy prices everything went down a little bit since may and we're still you know a little bit in that period of time where you know when people look look at what we're actually doing from the outside they say why are you still doing it it's all broke uh you know crypto is that finally um we all don't think so we do need to discuss that but what is your outlook into 2023? I know it's a super hard question, but it's a little interesting to look in the future. So what are your main 
things you're working on that you can already talk about or what is making you optimistic that we will see a brighter future ahead of us? Yeah, so 2023 is going to be a really exciting year. We're starting already really strong with the exhibition at Galerie Lafayette Champs-Élysées on the 4th of January. So we're super excited about that. And then after that, we have a lot of plans to really push the technology. So to improve it, to bring more and better experiences such as bringing spin VR accessible to mobile phones and desktop computers apart from the VR headset, also bringing shoppable experiences inside spin VR. And overall, we're very excited to continue to work with digitizing more buildings, more artwork, more clothing, and just continue to push digital projects with the aim of shifting the industry to a digitized and connected circular economy. I'm exhausted. <laughs> this has been a crazy year. I mean, like the last three weeks in and of itself, I feel like Web3 has these like literally three week cycles of, you know, the hamster wheel. Um, yeah. And it's definitely ramping up towards the end of the year. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for, you know, more stability in the market. Um, what I do think is good is at the beginning of this year, we had so much going on. It was like drinking from a fire hose um, and, and really kind of trying to figure out what is this, what is this Web3 thing? Where are the use cases? How are we driving value? Um, obviously, we're in a, a very different market today. Um, and, and I think, you know, the outcome of that is that uh, the way that brands or creators or IP are, are looking at this space is a lot more considered. Um, they're building in, you know, more strategies. It's heads down. It's low and slow. I think, you know, leaning on those uh, principles will, will help us build more sustainability within our ecosystems and and build better asset classes for our consumers and collectors. Um, so I'm hopeful that you know we can we can put our heads down, build, get back to business. Um, and like we said, it's a it's a theme. It's still really early. We've got a lot of work to do. Good. And some secret projects you're working on. Some alpha for everyone here in that room. <laughs> Well, I just give it's. I gave you guys the alpha on uh, Seeds of Happiness. We'll also be at uh, Art Basel Miami, um, so that's really exciting. Um, you'll see some inter interesting things come uh, our way in the new year. Uh, it's waiting yeah, for the right time. It seems Miami becomes the hotspot around Art Basel for great NFT events. Constantinos, I mean, what makes you looking forward for twenty twenty three? Oh wow. Um... I wish I had half the things I can't even even talk about, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, uh, but we, we are talking with a lot of brands and uh, there are some uh, big players in, in, in the fashion industry who are looking at this stuff closely. And um, yeah, that's that's very exciting. And also, I just can't wait for the moment for like, I don't know, like a Doja Cat or, or like a big celebrity to just be wearing her digital fit and you know and then the floodgates just open so i don't know if this will happen in the next year maybe in the next two years maybe um so that's something i'm I'm definitely looking forward to and um i think what Inst instagram is doing right now is really exciting introducing uh digital collectibles um i just can't wait for the buzzwords to disappear uh, you know nfts fidgetals or, yeah i just want to i just want to sell pet ligo shoes and without the digital, without the NFT, and I want it to be as easy as possible for people with, with without the wallets even, and just um, with their phone or whatever. So, um, yeah, hopefully over the next year, two years, maybe we'll start seeing seeing some changes. But that's a great goal. So, what do you think, Sebastian? Things are going worse for you in the future, or even better now? You know the economic outlook is medium. So do people spend less on art or even more because they want to have something beautiful? What are, What is your take on on where are we heading in that NFT space? Uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the the art world, we're just coming out of uh, a week of sales in New York, which have been bigger than any any week of sales in, in, in history. Um, I, I would expect um, a, a flight towards quality. Um, so I think as people have been looking back, particularly in the, the, the NFT space, looking back over the last 18 months, two years and seeing which, you know, which artists had 
um, very important projects. You know, what's 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 stood the test of time? Who's been interacting most um, cleverly with the blockchain and using that as a medium um, rather than something so sort of just sort of just image based? Let's say. So, I think there'll be a, a reassessment of what quality digital art is, and there will be a um, a flood back into into those artists. Um, that would be my expectation. There's been a, a huge amount of investment and continues to be an increasing amount of investment into Web3 technology, um, seeing the metaverse as where the internet is heading and, and, and not much more than that, a more immersive version of the, the internet um, that we're used to. Um, this, is, this is the direction of travel, the investment going in there, the increasing adoption, even if it is at a nascent stage. Um, I, I think we all believe um, on this call that you know that it's heading in a in, in a good direction, but some of the noise will fall away, and uh, and a flight towards uh, quality and uh, use case, and I think user experience as well will also increase over that time. Thank you. Spin works with a wide range of designers and innovators who are representative of the space. Can you share a little bit about what you see as criteria for the rising stars? Yes. Yeah, so I love like a everyone that we work with, whether it's a designer or a large corporation or an innovator, we always need to feel like they are really aligned with our mission to move towards a digitized and connected circular economy and really understand the values that we share. So we've created for this four points, which are essentially our criteria um, measuring points, which are materials, process, planets, and people. And apart from these four, we also have every year a focus at the CFS Summit. The focus of this year's CFS Summit is rendering the digital reality. So here we were really looking into, for example, independent designers that understand the power of digitization and of, well, the topic we've been discussing this whole panel talk, um, the digital NFTs and how to use these to really apply them in a practical way that will help circularity. So for example, we have 8IGB Community Clothing, which is an independent brand based in France, and they really understand and are really keen on using the digital twins across their entire collection to showcase to buyers. So instead of sending them or to, to mount a showroom or to send them the physical samples, they will sell, send them the digital twins. And that is saving them a lot of physical resources. And it's really interesting to see how such a young brand that maybe doesn't have that many resources is really putting time and effort into making sure that every item of their collection has these digital twins because they understand how important it is in terms of reducing waste. So that's just one example. On the other side, we have Melon, for example, which are uh, footwear brands that is soon also going to be expanding beyond footwear. And they are quite unique for designing within virtual reality. So they go inside virtual reality, the headsets, and are designing in that space and to be able to. And so when I spoke to them, it was they explained that it really helps them to reduce space because they can actually see and visualize the, the shoe from all angles a lot more easily and work faster and also make, make less mistakes. So that means that when they produce, it's uh, probably going to be more accurate and therefore they need to make less trials until they reach the, the, final, the final prototype. Thank you so much. This gives me a really good feeling that I'm in the right spot, that you're optimistic as well that I'm not on my own once in a while. I think I'm I'm heading the wrong way. Everyone else is heading in the other direction. No, but thanks a lot. And I'm looking at you, Enrique. I hope we made it in time, uh, not too long. And if I, I hand over for you to have the closing words. Thank you everyone for joining today's conversation, the right way to create a digital NFT. We are so grateful to Jurgen and our speakers, Nicole, Sebastian, Alexia, Constantinos for all the insights and tackling some of these really difficult questions. We would also like to thank our media partner, Vogue Philippines, and CFS hub partner, Caring, our retail partner, Gallery Lafayette, and community partners, Amex and Meta. We look forward to keeping this discourse alive throughout the duration of the summit 
as well as through the year with CFS programming. You can visit our newly launched CFS page at cfs.passion for more news, insights, analysis on building digital worlds.